So thank you, and uh, thanks to the Sarah for asking me to come, and congratulations, and glad you could make it back for my talk. <laughs> So I changed the title a little bit because uh, when I looked at the program, uh, I, you know, I put this title in back in August, and it turned out to be essentially the same title as what I talked about at Sanibel a month or so ago. And Sarah was there, and uh, Fred was there too, and so I, I, I changed this talk to add in a bunch of different stuff. Um, so uh, it, a lot of it is a little bit uh, really new. It's mostly not published. Uh, and maybe some speculative things in there, but uh, anyway, uh, the idea is is we're looking at ion ion reactions that will allow us to introduce more selectivity in the tandem mass spec experiment uh, using very selective ion chemistries. So uh, I just broke down some of the important components in an MSMS experiment making ions. And this is where Sarah has really made a big impact, uh, probing ions, and uh, that's really uh, where the focus is of this talk, and then uh, transporting and measuring ions. So those are, for people who are really focused on what happens inside a mass spectrometer, those are the opportunity areas. So today in this uh, sort of theme of, sent of uh, selective chemistries, I'm going to talk about charge inversion a little bit. I put some slides in here for, uh, for David Klemmer because he and I have been talking about synthesizing peptides in mass spectrometers, so I have a little bit of that. Uh, I'll just mention a little bit about uh, metal ions, and then I want to talk very, uh, at the end, this is somewhat speculative, but, but uh, an idea that we're trying to pursue where we're going to introduce weak spots into proteins so that when we do tandem mass spec on them, we can get an enzyme-like cleavages so that we can do top-down fingerprinting of proteins. So we'll, we'll see what you think about that. Okay, so we first start with charge inversion. And I'll harken back to some work that we published a couple years ago where we were using ion-ion char -ion charge inversion reactions where we take a singly charged ion, react it with a multiply charged ion of opposite polarity, and then look at the opposite uh, polarity mode to see which, which ions made it over to the other polarity. And uh, the example that we used was looking at uh, amino acids in uh, precipitated blood plasma. So this is a very complicated mixture, and, uh, and, and what we wanted to do is discriminate against the chemical noise. And the basis of the discrimination is most of the chemical noise in the positive ion mode has a basic site, but, but most of it don't have acidic sites. But amino acids are, are they're, they're amphiprotic. So they have, a, they have the, the uh, N-terminus and they have the, uh, uh, the carboxylic acid group. So they should be able to, to accommodate both polarities. So the idea was, here's the positive ion spectrum. React this with uh, the multiply charged anions that do we, we derive from PAMM uh, polymers. And the, the species that don't have negative sites, they'll undergo a single proton transfer and they'll be neutralized, so they go away. And the ones that have uh, an acidic will undergo, uh, at least some fraction will undergo a double proton transfer, and they'll show up as a negative ion. And so this, uh, so this precipitated blood plasma was spiked with these three amino acids. This is the positive ion spectrum in the, in this, in the same M over Z region. And uh, there, those peaks are in there, but actually some of them are down these, these small peaks. And when you do the charge inversion, they, they come right out. So we got about a factor of 200 improvement in signal-to-noise after these ions go through that process. So that's an example of selectivity. Well, we're interested in expanding this further to look at uh, phosphopeptides and sulfopeptides. And now these are all peptides. So all pep you know, peptides, are all, they're all amphoteric. So how do we build in some discrimination to be able to screen for... Uh, for, say, phosphopeptides in a complex mixture. And uh, so we came upon, there was there's some work that uh, Amina Woods had done where she had used uh, peptides with several arginines uh, in, in there, and when she sprayed them mixed with uh, phosphopeptides, she would see these adducts. And that's because the arginines bind quite strongly to the uh, phosphate groups. 
So this is the, then the process that we're, we look at. So if we look in the negative mode, which is phosphopeptides generally ionize pretty well in the negative mode, and we use this particular reagent where just three arginines is N-terminally acetylated and the C-terminus is methylosterified, well, we can make a complex. This is now, this is in the mass spectrometer by an ion ion reaction. And some fraction of them, depending on what the M is, they, they may undergo a single proton transfer and be neutralized. Some might undergo a double proton transfer. And some, if, if the interaction is sticky enough, will survive and we'll see this charge inverted adduct. Okay, so these are the scenarios. So when M is neutralized, it's because it's the molecule's not very basic and not very sticky. Double proton transfer, it's not very sticky, but it's basic enough to pull some protons off of that pretty basic reagent. And then the stabilized intermediate is charge inversion by attachment. So this is sort of the cartoon of how it works and the variables that we have to play with. So the this, this stickiness, the strength of the interaction is represented by this well depth. So the, if we can make that as deep as possible for the things that we want, then we're going to more likely see the adduct. And then the process is one or two, which are these proton, singular double proton transfer. That depends on the nature of the analyte. That's, that's the, and that difference is the difference in proton affinities. So by playing with the characteristics of the reagent, we can make this well depth more shallow or deeper. And then we also have an energy filter that we can use. So we're doing the chemistry here. And then the energy with which we eject these ions from this reaction region, which is pressurized into this mass analyzer, we can, we can heat the ions up by CID. So we can then change this level by changing that energy between Q2 and Q3. So those are the parameters we have to play with uh, to do these experiments. So our initial proof of principle is illustrated here. These just summarize separate experiments. So here's a sulfo uh, leucine keflin reacting with RRR, not modified at the N and C terminus in this case. And when you do the charge inversion experiment, you get 100% adduct formation. So that's, that's because of the strong interaction with the sulfate group. So here's a phosphopeptide. We do the charge inversion experiment. You basically see 100% adduct formation. That's what we want. And so here's, and here's poly D, which has just got carboxylates. And we do the charge inversion experiment, and it gets neutralized. And all you see is the singly protonated reagent. So, uh, so that's, a, that's because the sulfate and the phosphate are sticky, and the carboxylate's not so sticky. Right. Big, there's a actually significant difference there. So if we take, uh, the, here's the negative ion spectrum of the mixture. You do the charge inversion experiment, and then here are the, here's the phosphopeptide, here's the sulfopeptide, and you discriminate against the carboxylate. So if we take this uh, to a triptych digest, so we took a ubiquitin digest, and we spiked in some phospho, phosphorylated YGGFL. This is the normal negative ion mass spectrum. Here's the phosphopeptide, and then here's the other peptides that we see, some of the other uh, triptych peptides. You do the, the charge inversion experiment. Here's the YGGFL complex, so that it pretty much all stuck. We don't see any uh, double proton transfer. For a couple of these, we see a little bit. We also see some uh, attachment for these species. Now, these, they, they have the, they all have uh, uh, multiple acidic sites, so that, that may be a reason why some of them react that way. Uh, some, of that, some of these uh, peptides also react by double proton transfer, but you'll notice that all these that, that don't have any basic sites in there, they're all gone. They've all been neutralized. And, uh, the only th the, and so it's really clear that we have enhanced this one. So we can, we can we, looking at tuning this a little bit better, we can also tune that Q3, Q4, uh, uh, two voltage difference, and we think we can get some pretty good discrimination there. So we'll, we'll t look at some more complicated mixtures with phosphopeptides. So that looks promising. So there's another idea that we had that came out of a discovery uh, that we can methylesterify or alkylesterify uh, peptides and proteins in the mass spectrometer if we use quaternary ammonium compounds as reagents. So this is just EDTA. 
If you react ED, doubly charged EDTA with uh, uh, tetramethyl ammonium, what you'll get out of that is you see that you see an adduct here, and if you activate the adduct, you get a, what looks like an M plus 14, but you've, you've actually transferred a, a methyl cation over to one of the carboxylate groups. And then if you activate that, it loses methanol, which is a signature that you've methylesterified the, uh, that molecule. So that's a, that's a new kind of ion transfer reaction for us. So uh, we were interested in what, uh, how that might work with uh, peptides and uh, phosphopeptides. Well, I should just mention, just to give you, convince you that this is really uh, what we're seeing. So you can, ch you can look, here's tetrabutylamine. Now you'll butylesterify the ion. Uh, tetraoctylamine, then you can, you can transfer that octal group over. So these are, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty robust and um, consistent. So here's, uh, this is really, really quite recent data. So here's, the, here's this phosphorylated YGGFL, just showing people what they already know. If you, if you activate that by CID, you, you lose a lot of the uh, phosphoric acid. You get, we get a fragment here that's lost, that's lost 80, that HPO3. Uh, but if we esterify it in the mass spectrometer, so if we take the dianion and transfer, a, in this case, an ethyl group over there and, do fra and fragment that, we see much less loss of, of uh, phosphoric acid. And in fact, we don't see much evidence for that at all. So what we're planning on doing there is using a diquat to do the charge inversion experiment to take the, this, this peptide over to the positive mode. It will be esterified in that case. And then we'll see if, this, if the plus one fragment without loss of H3PO4, some of the phosphate loss, which is usually a problem with, uh, with CID. So that's, a, that's another new chemistry. It's all happening in the mass spectrometer. But we already have an example, an analytically useful example, uh, that I can describe now. So this one, I gave uh, part of this talk at the international meeting, and Steve blanks me uh, back in September. He came up and said, I've got, a pro I've got just, the, just the thing for you to try. And he said, uh, we're, we're really interested in uh, phosphatidylcholine ions that have this uh, fixed charge head group. But the problem with, and they're easy to ionize as positive ions. It's trivially easy to ionize them. But we can't structurally characterize them very well because when you activate them, uh, basically everything pops off but the head group, and that's that's all you have left, and there's there's not much information there. So, but we also people have also uh, found that if they if they use an adduct uh, that's generated in the, in the solution, they can form some anions, and that gives us the structural information that we want. And he said uh, maybe you can do this in the mass spectrometer. So here's. The analyte now is the quat, but there's also a phosphate group here. And we just use a dianion here, dicarboxylic acid. It undergoes an ion-ion reaction, and two processes take place. There's a methyl transfer over to the carboxylate, and there's a proton transfer to the other carboxylate. And what you end up with is the anion of the uh, phosphatidylcholine. Loss, with the loss of a methyl that's really difficult to generate directly by electrospray. And if you do the MSMS of that, then you get out the information that you want. Okay, so that's another uh, gas phase transformation, very fast, tens of milliseconds in the mass spectrometer. Okay, so I'm going to move on from charge inversion now and talk a little bit about peptide synthesis. And uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to use, now we're using... Uh, some of the same chemistries that Don Hunt just talked about using in solution to modify the N-terminus, and that's using sulfo uh, uh, N-hydroxy succinamide esters. And we find that they react quite nicely in the mass spectrometer with neutral basic sites. And uh, typically in solution, you do this with lysines and N-termini. So here's the sulfo NHS group. It's got some uh, I have an X group uh, instead of an R group because I don't want to confuse you with arginine. Uh, and so you basically generate an amide bond with whatever you want, whatever this X group happens to be. So you can stick things onto the peptides and proteins. And the signature for the reaction is the loss of this NHS group. And we found that the, 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 an important criterion for all these reactions to work 
is that the uh, reactive molecule or anion or reagent has to have a sticky group on there because you need to form a long-lived complex for these reactions to be competitive with things like proton transfer and electron transfer. They need a long, these are more entropically constrained reactions, so they need longer lifetime. And so by having a sticky group on there, you can make these reactions work. I'm going to get to a little bit later, but I, I want to point out that we also discovered, we stumbled on, upon the fact that arginine, neutral arginine, also reacts like a shot with these sulfo NHS esters. They don't in solution. And we think the reason is because in, under normal pH conditions, arginine is protonated. And a, and a nucleophile, these are nucleophilic reactions, is happy with a, it's not a nucleophile when it's protonated. It's got its nucleus. Uh, if you go to lower, I mean, uh, rather higher pHs, you can probably make the chemistry occur, but the reagents hydrolyze at those, at those, uh, under those conditions. So typically people just don't think about modifying arginines in solution. But we showed that you can do it in the mass spectrometer if, uh, if, you, if you have the right conditions for your arginine. Okay, I'll, and we'll revisit that. So this is just an example of... Uh, of some of the chemistry, so we've, uh, if, if, for example, you want to improve the, the rate at which you can fragment something, you might stick a chromophore on there and shine a laser on it. People have done this in solution. What we want to do is say, go ahead and make, make, measure your mass, and then do the modification, and then you can shine light on it, and you've got, you, you don't have to do, do two separate experiments. So here's our reactant, doubly protonated version of this peptide. Uh, it, here's the long-lived complex that's formed by sticking this reagent onto it. If then you isolate and heat it up, the signature for the reaction is the loss of the sulfo NHS. If, if the reagent just pops off, then you get this M plus H. That's a signature that it just stuck, and then it just, you just drove it back off. But this one's a pretty efficient reaction. And then you can fragment it and find out uh, uh, where, the, where that substituent went on there. So that's just an example of, of one modification. So since you're generating an amide bond, then it should be possible for you to add an amino acid onto a peptide. And uh, so um, this was stimulated by conversations with David, who, who had shown that you could synthesize peptides by laser radiating clusters. And, uh, and we were talking about that, and I said, hmm, maybe you know, this should be able to work. Uh, by ion ion chemistry. So here's an example. And so I have a student of mine who's been working on this. And so he's, and he reads the literature to see how peptides are synthesized in the literature. And so he, he comes up with this reagent. So he uses this FMOC protected alanine uh, that's bound to, it's the ester, the sulfo NHS ester. And so here's the reagent. And he, he sticks that, or he reacts that with this polypeptide. And so here's the complex, here's the sticky uh, complex. If uh, you heat that up, the, uh, you see loss of sulfo NHS. Uh, you also see the whole thing pop off. So this fraction of the, of the polypeptide did not undergo a reaction, but this fraction did, right? So here we would say we've, uh, based on what we know, we've added an alanine onto the end of this peptide. And then if you but it's protected. And if you heat that up, it turns out that the protective group pops off in a, in a reasonably sizable fraction. FMOC is not the best to use, but that's what I have a slide of here. And then if you take that, you can activate that, and you get out a spectrum that looks like this. If you compare that gas phase generated result to the synthesized peptide that you make or that you buy, uh, you, and you compare them, they're the same spectrum. So basically, we've, done, we've added this amino acid onto the N-terminus. Okay, how about two amino acids? So this is the addition of a dipeptide, and so now this is GG, uh, and, and the, my student, Will McGee, has found that the Bach protection works much better than f mock protection, so we switched to that protective group. So here is, we've generated an electrostatic complex, we activate that. There's the sulfo NHS law, so we've added the GG on there. If you activate that, the Bach group pops off, and so this is our, our polypeptide where, where we've added a dipeptide onto the N-terminus, and then here's the CID, and I, I don't have the 
we've done the solution experiment and it looks the same. Okay, so efficiency is, a, is, a, is, a, is of interest. And so this is a summary of the efficiency of the process up in our hands at the moment. So the experiment I just described is this doubly protonated peptide reacting with this Bach protected gly gly sulfo NHS ester. You generate the complex, you activate that, it loses sulfo NHS. You isolate that, you activate it, you lose the Bach, then gives you the, the product that's the dipeptide added product, and that's here in red. So the blue here is the, is the initial isolated precursor ion, and this is the final product. And so that gives you an idea what the efficiency, and in this case, about 30%. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. So that's, uh, this is sort of can you do this kind of experiment, and we're still thinking about how we might use that analytically. Uh, okay, so here's a, just a, taking it one step further. Here's a tripeptide. Uh, not, not really any new information here. Generate the addict, activate it. There's the tripeptide added on. You heat that up, it loses the Bach. It looks just like the dipeptide, really. It's just another glycine, and, and then there's the generated peptide. So um, that experiment seems to work pretty well. And it's very nice that these, that these protecting agents are mass spec cleavable, so that makes it convenient. Okay, so now I want to step back and talk a little bit about uh, biopolymer analysis and, and really along the same lines as the theme of, of Don's talk, and that's protein characterization. And I like to think about uh, sort of the two extremes that you might want to have. And so in one extreme, you'd like to have a cleavage at each residue that preserves all the modifications. And so if you do that, you can do a complete de novo sequencing of the intact protein. And ideally, we would be able to do that on, on everything. But as the, pre, as the proteins get bigger and bigger and bigger, then there's more and more fragment peaks. And if this charge is distributed amongst all of those, that dilutes down the signal. So the good thing is you get this detailed structural characterization. But things get more difficult, even when you can do it, uh, because of signal dilution. And we do approach this in, in some cases. So we're in, in this uh, uh, side of things, I think we're doing pretty well. What we're curious about is whether or not we can come up with a way to, in a, in a rational way, come up uh, with uh, cleavage at a few specific sites so where you have a, a relatively few but quite abundant peaks, sort of like an enzyme works in triptych digestion and solution. But we don't want to take it to completion, we just want to do single clips. We don't want to do every clip. So you'd get le less detailed structural information. It might be better suited for quantitation using single or multiple reaction monitoring. S you do see some, sometimes aspartic acid residue cleavages uh, are, are, are predominant with proteins under certain conditions, but it's difficult to direct. But if you're able to do it, then you might be able to come up with a what, what I call a top-down gas phase fingerprinting approach. So let's see. So this is a slide that I, I put in for a lot of my talks. It just points out that the things that we have to play with in our field to characterize the primary structures of molecules is the ion type and the dissociation method. And we're always sort of mixing and matching those kinds of things to get out the structural information that we want. And we think of gas phase of, as ion-ion reactions as ways to uh, convert one ion type to another. So even ETD, in my, the way I look at it, is even though it is a dissociation method, it's really a changing of, of, of one ion type to another that gives us the information that we want. It's taking an even electron ion, making it a hypervalent odd electron ion that's uh, sort of an ion transformation that takes place by an ion-ion reaction. So just to give an example of a favorable case with CID, if you pick the right charge state, plus nine of alpha synuclein, you can get out quite a sizable fraction of the sequence. But it's quite charge state dependent. So uh, here's plus 15. You get 44% cleavage with uh, beam type CID. Ion trap CID, only 22%. If you go down to plus nine, which is generally you don't form by electrospray, it's too low, so you have to sort of move the charge states down a little bit. You can get as high as 85% cleavage. Um, 
But anyway, this is another illustration of the ion type. Different charge states are different ion types and how they give you different information. Okay, then moving to metals, and uh, again, going with this ion type theme. So here's an example of somatostatin, and it turns, somatostatin is a cyclic peptide, uh, disulfide bond right here, that's really difficult to characterize by CID. So this is the, the CID MSMS spectrum of somatostatin, and really, the only clearly identifiable peak that you get here is this cleavage outside the disulfide bond. So that's a little bit uh, problematic. If we look at the, at the uh, doubly charged anions, so anions will cleave disulfide bonds, and so you get some more information out from the, from the negatively charged ion. ETD does a great job, because we know that uh, the electron transfer, electron capture is selective for disulfide bonds. It does well. But we also, when Richard O'Hare visited my lab, we also played around with gold, and gold really likes disulfide bonds, and so gold does a good job of cleaving disulfide bonds pretty selectively as well. So, uh, and we know how to put metal, any metal ion in the periodic table, uh, if we can get a salt of it, we can put it into a peptide or a protein with an ion-ion reaction. So here's an example. Uh, here's, if we took, uh, take the six plus ion of, uh, of insulin and we react it twice with, uh, with gold one uh, chloride anion, so this is a sequential reaction. We can put two golds into the, into the insulin, and when you do that and activate it, you'll see the, big, the biggest products that you get out are the separated chains. Right? When you do that with the multiply charged ions by just normal CID, you don't see any cleavages from inside. You don't see any evidence for cleavage of the disulfide bonds. So that's, a, that's putting some selectivity into, in, uh, by changing the ionizing, the ionizing reagent and doing it in the gas phase and not having to mix it into solution. So more recently, we came upon uh, some literature that showed uh, some inorganic chemists have been using pe uh, platinum complexes to do uh, cleavages of proteins in solution. So and they cleave at methionine residues. So we tried platinum, uh, we put some platinum here into a, a peptide, and this is a model peptide that we use. And uh, sure enough, we see it looks like there's some selectivity here uh, with platinum for cleavage at the methionine residue. Uh, we tried gold as well, and we don't see that selectivity with gold. And then down here, the protonated molecule doesn't show any sign for that either. You don't see this. Y6 is the signature for this, uh, the cleavage uh, that we expect to see with methionine. So there's another uh, possible uh, avenue for us to explore to in start introducing some selective cleavages. Okay, so now I'm going to finish up talking about ornithine. So ornithine is the same as lysine, but one less methylene group. And uh, it's, uh, ornithine is not coded by DNA. It is, it, uh, it is Im important. In, uh, in the body, but it's typically not found in proteins. But it turns out that uh, for uh, reasons that I won't go into, we sort of stumbled on, on this because we were making ornithine in the mass spec with our ion ion chemistry. And so and, and when we did that, we were noticing that we were seeing very selective cleavages at, uh, at these uh, modified sites. So here's an example of a uh, of a peptide that's got an arginine in it. This is the normal MSMS CID spectrum. If we convert that in solution using hydrazine to ornithine and, you, and fragment it, you get this very large B6 ion cleavage right here. And then you get a second step cleavage to give uh, the next residue down. So this is the, what, what happens is you, this, it, you form this really nice stable six-membered lactam ring. So lysine will do this too, but it's a seven-membered ring, and it's not as favored. So uh, the fact that once you get to the six-membered ring, and it turns out when you get to the, the five also works quite nicely, you get this very selective cleavage. So if you convert R to O, then you, can, you introduce a weak spot in, into the peptide. Okay. And so here's just an example of... Uh, what happens when the ornithine's at the C terminus? So we, here's YGGFLR, MSMS spectrum. Just for comparison, YGGFLK, MSMS spectrum. And then YGGFLO, and this favored cleavage that's here on this side, that's a water loss, right? So that, this is going to generate, this, this leaving group here is 
is a water, and then you form this lactam ring on the, your B ion, and if you activate that, it goes big time to B5. And that's this second step rearrangement that also gives rise to a nice stable uh, product. So then we were interested in, in how weak, the, you know, this, the ornithine effect is relative to the aspartic acid and proline effects. So people are uh, familiar with those favored cleavages under certain conditions for peptides. So here's the aspartic acid. So it has the opportunity to, for the aspartic acid effect. It has an opportunity for the proline effect. If the charges are locked down, say at the arginine, and there's no mobile protons, then the aspartic acid effect dominates. That gives you the Y7 ion. So this is a classic example of the aspartic acid effect. If you have a doubly protonated molecule, now you introduce a mobile proton. And since that proline uh, nitrogen, uh, amide nitrogen, is more basic than, than others, it tends to cleave there. And so this, you get a, quite a strong proline effect here, right? And then if you put, for the singly charged ion, when the, asp when the aspartic acid effect is dominant, if you change that to O, now it becomes a big ornithine cleavage. So the, the ornithine effect beats the aspartic acid effect here. And if you look at the doubly charged ion, it's got the ornithine in it. The ornithine effect beats the proline effect. So it really is a weaker spot than, we're, than we are accustomed to. So then we went ahead and we converted uh, one of the arginines in melatonin is somewhat bigger to an ornithine. And so here's the, down here is the MSMS spectrum of the three plus charge state of melatonin. And these are the summary of the cleavages that you see. If you replace one of the, there's only two arginines in here, over here. If you replace one of those with an ornithine, the spe this spectrum turns into this spectrum. And it's all dominated by the ornithine. Okay, so this is a basically introducing a weak spot in here, totally changes the uh, the cleavage, uh, the cleavages, and and focuses the signal into these ornithines. So that's an, we want to pursue whether or not we can do this in the mass spectrometer, and it turns out that we can do this because uh, whenever you do this reaction where you where you conjugate to arginine. And you activate that. One of the most one of the, so this is the chemistry for the reaction of, of modifying arginine. So you can you can stick a an R group uh, this group onto an arginine, and if you heat that up, we find that that f depending on what the R group is, you'll tear off this piece right here, which is loss of 42, and that gives you ornithine. Okay, so that's a way to take an arginine and turn it into an ornithine. And it turns out that, you know, anybody who's done a lot of MSMS of peptides knows that 42 loss is pretty common when there's not a protonated arginine in the system. But it's usually a small, it's a small side chain loss peak in, in addition to everything else. So the efficiency is not very high. But if you do this by ion ion reactions, so there's an example of, a, of a, this polypeptide. We make the complex, we activate it, it loses sulfo NHS. You activate that, and one of the big peaks that you get out of this is this M minus 42. That's, that's an ornithine uh, containing peptide now, and you take the MSMS of that, and these, these big peaks here are the ornithine effects, but there's multiple peaks because there's one, two, three different places that you can generate the ornithine. Okay. So it turns, so most of the time the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time here. So most of the time, arginine is protonated, but we've, I, got, I think we've got to work around, around that because we've discovered that even if, uh, if, if you have a sodium on the arginine instead of arginine, arginine uh, still reacts just fine. So if we can switch the proton with a sodium, the sodium still may be on the arginine, but it will still react. And uh, we know how to put metal ions into peptides because we've been doing that for a long time. And uh, so this is just an example. Uh, this just showed this protonated, is, the protonated arginine is not reactive, so you put the complex on and the entire reagent pops off. If you have a sodiated version of the peptide, you put the complex on, uh, you, you put the reagent on, and it loses sulfo NHS. So the sodiated version. And if you change your reagent now, to one that's got a sodium in it. So now we're using a cluster of our reagent, two, two sulfo NHS reagents with, that's bound by a sodium. Uh, and and you, you heat that up. 
the species that loses the, uh, the proton, if you activate that, it reacts and it gives you uh, a very nice uh, adduct formation. So I, can't, I don't have a protein to show you now, but we're working hard on this. But, but the idea is if we, can, if we have a population of, of proteins uh, and, and we can introduce by our ion ion chemistry a weak spot into this mixture and then activate that, we hopefully would get a series of peaks that represent single, single clips, single enzymatic clips. And with uh, some, we've already simulated this with uh, database searching. This works just great at identifying proteins if we can do it. So that's sort of where we're heading. So just to summarize, the, we think there, is a, there are many possibilities that uh, we haven't even gone into yet that for introducing greater selectivity based on the alteration of ion type. This is what I talked about today. And I want to finish by pointing out, uh, so this, this person is, uh, is Will McGee. He's, uh, he did the peptide synthesis work and, and did all the ornithine effect work. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of his effort was represented in this talk. And uh, some of the work with getting arginine to work was done by Boone Prentice. Okay, thank you.